questions to the Prime Minister. Mr Keith Bass. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, and in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Keith Baz. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Launched last week, Action on Sugar aims to reduce the sugar content of food and drinks by up to 30 per cent because of the twin epidemics of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Voluntary arrangements with manufacturers, though well-intentioned, have not worked. Will the Prime Minister meet with a delegation of health experts to discuss this issue? And can we enlist his support in the war on sugar by asking him to give up sugar and sugary drinks for one day this week? Yeah. I'm sure that last proposal would have the strong support of Mrs Cameron, so uh, I will take that up if I possibly can. Can I first of all commend the Honourable Gentleman for raising this issue and for speaking out on the issues of diabetes and obesity with such consistency, because they are major health concerns for our country. We are taking them very seriously. We're rolling out the NHS Health Check programme to identify all those between 40 and 74 at risk of diabetes. Childhood obesity rates are falling, but there's more that needs to be done. I'm happy to facilitate discussions between him and my right hon. Friend, uh, the Health Secretary, to have the discussions that he wants, but we take this issue very seriously. We think the responsibility deal has achieved great things, but there's more to be done. Mr Henry Smith. Uh, Mr Speaker, last week I had the honour of uh, opening the new Network Rail Regional Operating Centre at Three Bridges in my constituency. Can my right honourable friend say what investment this government is putting into the existing rail network to help commuters and travellers as part of a long term economic plan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Investing in infrastructure is a key part of our long term economic plan to make sure that Britain's economy can be a success now in the future. We've seen major investment in the South East with Thameslink, Crossrail, East West Rail, all delivering new services for London and the South East. And I can tell him that between 2015 and 2020, we are planning to invest over 56 billion on roads, rail, and local transport. And it is important to make the point that that is three times as much as the planned investment in HS2. So to those who fear that HS2 will take all of the investment, it won't. Three times as much will be spent elsewhere. Ed Miliband. Mr Speaker, RBS are expected to ask the Government to approve bonuses of over 100 per cent on multi-million pound salaries. Does the Prime Minister think that's acceptable? Well, what I can tell the right hon. Gentleman about RBS is we will continue with our plans for RBS that have seen bonuses come down by 85 per cent, that have seen the bonus pool at one third of the level that it was under Labour. And I can confirm today that just as we've had limits on cash bonuses of £2,000 at RBS this year and last year, we'll do the same next year as well. Mr Speaker, I think we can all agree with the general sentiments he expresses about bonuses, but today I'm asking him a very specific question. RBS are talking to parts of the government about the proposal to pay over 100 per cent bonuses. He is the Prime Minister. The taxpayer will foot the bill. Will he put a stop to it right now by telling RBS to drop this idea? I will tell him exactly what we are saying to RBS, and it is this, that if there are any proposals to increase the overall pay, that is pay and bonus bill, at RBS, at the investment bank, any proposals for that, we will veto it. What a pity the past government never took an approach like that. Mr Speaker, he, he did. Uh, however long it takes, the questions will be heard and the answers will be heard. Mr Ed Miliband. Mr Speaker, I'm not asking about increases in pay and bonuses. I'm asking a very simple question. I'm asking a very simple question about the proposal that is expected to come forward from RBS which is to pay more than 100% bonuses on pay. Now, we know when RBS is making a loss, 
when they themselves say they've been failing small businesses, and these kind of bonuses lead to risky one-way bets, we know it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Mr Speaker, when ordinary families are facing the cost of living crisis, surely he can say that for people earning a million pounds, a bonus of one million should be quite enough. If he's not asking me about the overall of pay and bonuses at RBS, why on earth isn't he? That's what he should be asking about. And what I've said, what I've said very clearly, is that the remuneration, the total pay bill at that investment bank must come down. But I have to say, Mr Speaker, to get a lecture from the right honourable gentleman when we had from them the biggest bust anywhere in the world with RBS, we had 125% mortgages at Northern Rock, we had all the embarrassment about Fred Goodwin. He comes, he comes here every week. He comes here every week to complain about a problem created by the Labour Party. Last week it was betting, this week it's banking. He rises up with all the authority, moral authority of Reverend Flowers, and we still. Where's the apology for the mess they made of RBS in the first place? In the last two years, uh, my, council's, my council's Opportunity Sutton Growth Plan has created £317 million worth of inward investment, has halved youth unemployment and seen record numbers of new businesses starting up. Sutton is also the home of the Institute for Cancer Research and the Royal Marsden Hospital. Given that life sciences are an engine for innovation and growth, what support will the government give to realise Sutton's plan of a life science cluster based around these world-renowned centres of excellence. No, I think my right honourable friend makes a very good point about the strengths that uh, Sutton has. Obviously, we've got the patent box to attract life science businesses to Britain. We've also got the investment in apprenticeships. That is very important. And, of course, the Office of the Life Sciences, which he knows, bringing the business department and health department together to help bring life sciences jobs here. Working with local enterprise partnerships, I think there's a great opportunity for more investment in these very important businesses. David Lammy. The Mark Duggan inquest concluded last week with a verdict of lawful killing. It also found errors in the police investigation. Last week also saw PC Wallace admitting that he lied about the Right Honourable Member for Sutton Coalfield. Does the Prime Minister accept it is now urgent that we reform the Independent Police Complaints Commission? Well, first of all, can I commend what he said about the importance of people respecting uh, the outcome of the inquest? We have proper legal processes in this country and we should respect their outcomes. Uh, he also knows that there is still an ongoing independent police complaints investigation into that case and we should let it uh, do its work. I'm always prepared to look at uh, reforms of uh, organisations like this. There was a big reform some years ago to make the IPCC much more independent. Uh, he's shaking his head and saying it isn't working. Very happy to look at arguments. I have to say, in the issue of uh, PC Wallace, this was uh, deeply shocking to see an email uh, that purported to be someone who had witnessed an event, and you're told it's a member of the public, and then it turns out it's a serving police officer. That was deeply troubling and deeply disturbing. So I'm not saying all is well. I think the vast majority of Brit the British police service do a magnificent job. They put their lives on the line for us day after day. We should always recall that. But I'm happy to look at proposals for how we can strengthen these arrangements. Sir Andrew Bingham. Congratulating the street crane company in my High Peak constituency. And furthermore, can I invite the Chancellor or himself to see how, with D2N2 let money from the Regional Growth Fund, they are embarking on at first phase £1.5 million expansion programme, which will total £2.7 million, increase the jobs by 20%. Their exports across the world demonstrate the power of British business and that they, like this government, have got a long term economic plan. Well, I'm grateful for what my honourable friend says. I think we have seen the Regional Growth Fund produce some real uh, economic success stories, and that is being combined with our long-term economic plan to encourage businesses to take on employees, to put in place the infrastructure, and, as he says, quite importantly, to back exports uh, in terms of Britain's performance and get out there and sell to the world. Cathy Jameson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given that we have recently heard reports that half a dozen terrorist suspects could soon be released onto our streets, 
Can the Prime Minister give an assurance that public safety will not be compromised or put at risk once the government's latest experiment with terrorism controls expires? What I can assure her and the House about is that we will always take every step necessary to keep the British public safe. I think that the TPIM measures are working well. It's a complete myth to pretend that control orders would, would be kept in place forever. Many, many people were taken off control orders during the existence of, of that uh, set of measures. And all of the time, I listened very carefully to the head of the Metropolitan Police Service and to the heads of the Security Service who were involved in drawing up these measures and who advised us on how best to keep our country safe. Daniel Kaczynski. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. In, the, in the first six months of last year, Shrewsbury benefited from the highest number of business start-ups in our town's history. Now the unemployed claimant count is down to 2.5 per cent in Shrewsbury. Will the Prime Minister join me in praising Shrewsbury's entrepreneurial spirit, but also redouble government efforts through UKTI West Midlands to help more Shrewsbury firms to export? Yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely right. We are seeing an enterprise uh, revolution in our country again. 400,000 more businesses in existence today compared with 2010. And I think the point he makes about small businesses and exports is particularly important. Currently, one in five of them export. If we could turn that into one in four, we would wipe out our trade deficit. So I absolutely support the excellent work he does to call UKTI, UKTI to account and to encourage them to do everything they can to back Britain's entrepreneurs. Ed Miliband. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, there are sites, Mr. Speaker, there are sites all over the country with planning permission, with the capacity for a quarter of a million, uh, sorry, 250,000 houses where nothing is happening. Some of them, some of them, some of them, some of them being hoarded, some of them being hoarded by developers. I'm in. I'm in favour of giving powers to say to developers that hold land without building on it, use it or lose it. The Prime Minister said the policy was nuts. Does he still believe that? Prime Minister. We, we've just had a demonstration of the grasp of maths that was involved at the Treasury. No wonder, no wonder we had banks collapsing and all the rest of it. With that, uh, What I would say to the Honourable Gentleman is that house building is picking up. We're seeing a big increase in housing starts, a big increase in housing completions. Why I think his policy is, as he kindly put it, nuts, is this reason. Is that if you say to developers and companies, we're going to confiscate land unless you build, they will not go ahead with the building in the first place. His approach is to put a freeze on the whole of development rather than get Britain building, which is what we need to happen. Ed Miliband. To say the Prime Minister is incredibly complacent. House completions, house completions are at their lowest level since 1924. And I, I'm interested in what he says. I'm interested in what he says about the policy, because his own housing minister says that the policy might make a contribution, and the Mayor of London says we should be able to have a use it or lose it clause. Developers should be under no illusions that they can just sit on their land and wait for prices to go up. So is the policy nuts or is it the right thing to do? Prime Minister. What we need to keep going with is the policies of this government that are seeing house building increase. Here are, I know he doesn't like the facts. Nearly 400,000 new homes delivered since 2010. Housing starts in the last quarter were at their highest level for five years, 89% higher than the trough in 2009 when he was sitting in the Cabinet, a 16% increase in housing starts over the last 12 months compared with the year before. But here's the question he needs to answer. His, his, minister, his shadow ministers go around opposing our planning reforms, even though they're important to get Britain building, and time and again they are criticising proposals like Help to Buy that are helping our fellow countrymen and women realise the dream of home ownership. And here's one for him. If he cares about house building and home ownership, why not make those Labour councils get on with selling council houses to hard-working people? Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker in Labour councils they're building far more houses than in Tory councils. And frankly, I'm still no clearer at the end of this exchange what he thinks about the use it or lose it policy. His housing minister says he supports it. The mayor of London says he supports it. He doesn't know what he thinks. And, and here's the reality. He's not doing enough. He's not doing enough to close the gap between supply and demand. The truth is that the number of social housing starts is down. He's shelled his plans for new towns and rents are rising. Does he accept 
that Britain is building 100,000 fewer homes than we need to meet demand. Minister. Well, of course we need to build new homes. That's why we've reformed the planning system, which they oppose. That's why we've got help to buy, which they oppose. That's why we're helping in all the ways to get Britain building. But what we're seeing, Mr Speaker, is he's now having to jump around all over the place. It started off with, you know, the deficit reduction wasn't going to work. Now he can't make that argument. Then it was we needed Plan B. He can't make that argument. Next it was the cost of living, but yesterday we saw inflation fall to 2%. What we see is a government that's got a long-term economic plan and an opposition that hasn't got a clue. Can I welcome the government's renewed commitment to ensuring that my local communities benefit from the potential of shale gas? But can I urge the Prime Minister to do more to encourage both the companies and the scientific community to do more to resolve the very understandable and legitimate concerns that residents have about both the technology and the potential environmental impact? I think my honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this and to make the remarks that he does. I think that shale has a huge potential for our country. The figures are that if we recovered just 7% of the Boland shale reserves, that would provide us with gas in this country for 30 years, but we've clearly got to do a far better job at explaining and working with communities about the benefits and also talking frankly about the process. I think there's a huge amount of myths that are being put round in order to frighten people about shale gas extraction, whereas we can see in the United States it can be extracted safely and cleanly, providing effective, low-cost energy, green energy for our homes and for our businesses, and make our country more competitive at the same time. Ian Lavery. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As we sit here, the six British nationals, including Nick Doon, a former paratrooper, languishing in uh, prison in Chennai after being taken prisoner from uh, a ship off Nadil Tamur. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with me and, and other representatives of this House to discuss this yeah, issue yeah. to see if we can get these former paratroopers yeah, yeah. released from prison? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know how important this issue is, and I raised it personally uh, with Indian government ministers when I was recently in India. I've discussed it with the Foreign Secretary. I'll go on making sure we do everything that we can. If a meeting needs to be arranged between members of this House of Commons representing uh, the constituents, and I believe actually the Foreign Secretary represents one of these constituents himself, I'm very happy to arrange that. Ian Stewart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Investing in, yeah. investing in research and innovation is essential for our economic future. Does the Prime Minister agree that the Open University's new smart city research project to improve infrastructure is just one example of how Milton Keynes is leading the way in securing our long-term economic plan? I, uh, I, I visited the Open University uh, at Milton Keynes and it's an extremely impressive organisation. It's also leading a very important export drive in terms of our uh, universities. So I congratulate Milton Keynes for their representation on the Smart Cities Forum and for what the Open University is doing. I think there are many opportunities for Milton Keynes, not least uh, provided by HS2 as well, and I look forward to discussing them with him in future. Chris Evans. Constituents tell me all the time they can't afford food, can't afford to keep warm in winter, and can't afford to petrol in the car to go to work, or because their wages are not going far enough. Will the Prime Minister finally accept the cost of living is stretching families in this line and constituencies like mine to breaking point? Yeah. I, I totally accept that we are still recovering from the Great Recession that took £3,000 out of a typical family's income. But what we're seeing now is more people in work, including in Wales. We're seeing actually real wages now starting to rise. And I think we can be confident, yes, it's difficult, yes, it's still hard work, but our economy is growing and we want that to be a recovery for everyone in our country. Jesse Norman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The number of people in Hereford and South Herefordshire in receipt of job seekers allowance fell 31% yeah. between November 2012 and November 2013. Youth unemployment fell by an even more impressive 40%. Yeah. Does the Prime Minister share my view that the government's long-term plan is already giving employers the confidence to get hiring again? Yeah. 
I'm, I'm grateful for what my honourable friend says because an absolutely key part of our long term economic plan is to see a growing number of people in work in our country. We see 1.2 million more people in work in the West Midlands. Employment has risen by 60,000 since the election. Private sector employment is up 64,000. There's still further to go, particularly in the West Midlands, where we need to get particularly young people back to work. But the figures in his own constituency are very encouraging. Mr. Tom Watson. On his Amritsar inquiry, instead of ordering a civil servant to investigate, why doesn't the Prime Minister just ask Lords Geoffrey Howe and Leon Britton what they agreed with Margaret Thatcher and whether it had anything to do with the Westland helicopter deal at the time? I, I fear the Honourable Gentleman might have gone a conspiracy theory too, too far on this one. Look, uh, it is very important. It is very important that we get to the bottom of what happened, and that is why I have asked the Cabinet Secretary to re lead this review. He will establish this urgently and establish the facts. The process is underway. I want it to be fast. I want it to find out the truth, and the findings will be made public. I remember and will never forget my own visit to the Golden Temple in Amritsar. It is one of the most beautiful and serene places anywhere on this planet. And What happened at Amritsar 30 years ago led to a tragic loss of life. It remains a source of deep pain to Sikhs everywhere. Prime Minister Singh, in my view, was absolutely right to apologise for what has happened, and I completely understand the concerns that these papers raise. So let's wait for the outcome of the review by uh, Sir Jeremy Hayward. I don't want to prejudge the outcome, but I would note that so far it has not found any evidence to contradict the insistence by senior Indian Army commanders responsible at the time uh, that, the, that, the, the, that the responsibility for this it was planned and carried out solely by the Indian Army. I think that is important to put that, but we do need an inquiry so we can get to the bottom of this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. On the 30th of January, I will be hosting a Carlisle <laughs> Skills Fair for 70 yeah, businesses yeah, and training yeah, organisations, yeah, yeah, yeah. targeting 14 to 25 year olds with training and job opportunities. If Carlisle is to prosper and it needs a skilled workforce and successful businesses, yeah, yeah. would the Prime Minister give his support to this event? And would he confirm that he will remain and his government will remain committed to training and upskilling the young so that they benefit personally and local and business, national businesses succeed? First of all, can I commend my honourable friend for what he is carrying out in Carlisle? I think these jobs fairs and skills fairs and encouraging young people to think about apprenticeships and encouraging businesses to train people in apprenticeships are some of the most important things that we can do. We've got 1.5 million apprenticeships have started since the election. Over 250,000 apprenticeships have started in the North West uh, under this government, including in his constituency, and we must keep up this good work. Pat McFadden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister will be aware of the grave concern among British Sikhs about the reports in recent days of UK involvement in Operation Blue Star to storm the Golden Temple. He will also be aware that the broader events of 1984 in India resulted in the death of thousands of innocent Sikhs, and that this has left lasting grief and pain in the Sikh community here in the UK and around the world. This is an open wound which will not heal until the full truth is told. So can I ask him, on the process he has set up, whether he will ensure there is full disclosure of all government papers and information from that time, and that there is also, following that, a proper statement in this House where ministers can be questioned about this. Minister. Well, I think, uh, first of all, can I agree with him about the deep scars that this event left and the incredibly strong feelings that exist to this day. And as I say, anyone who visits the Golden Temple at Amritsar and sees what an extraordinary place of peace and tranquility and what an important site it is for the Sikh religion knows how powerful uh, uh, this, this point is. We are going to make sure this inquiry is held properly. Its findings will be made public, which I think is vitally important. As I say, in the end, I do not think anyone should take away uh, the responsibility for these events with the people who are properly uh, responsible for them, and I'm sure the inquiry will find that. In terms of holding a statement and revealing this I information and the findings to the House, I'll listen carefully to what he says, but I think a statement might well be the right approach. Tessa Munt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Prime Minister speak to his colleagues across government about the funding resulting from incentives for fracking being passed directly to parishes 
so that those communities who feel the impact of fracking are those who actually choose how that money is spent, yeah, yeah. rather than having to compete with district and county councils' other priorities. Yeah. Well, I think my honourable friend makes an important point. I mean, what we've set out is the overall level of financial support, so £100,000 when a well is dug, uh, up to £10 million, uh, theoretically, because of the 1% of revenue that will be paid, and then this absolutely vital point about 100% retention of business rates, which could have a very significant effect uh, for local government finance. Now, the point she makes is how do you divide that up between parishes, districts and counties, and also do you look at individual payments to individual households who might be inconvenienced? I think we should, get, we should look at very local options and making sure that parishes and individual people uh, will benefit. Uh, and I think it's something that colleagues will want to discuss and think about so we can really get this right and help this industry to take off. Anna. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm not sure if members are aware that anyone joining the police force will now have to pay £1,000 for a certificate before they even fill in the application form. A £1,000 bobby tax will make it harder for the police to look like the community that it serves and I represent. It will put off young people from poorer backgrounds and ethnic minorities from joining the police. We all know the Prime Minister admires characters like Harry Fleshman, but charging for army commissions was abolished in 1871. Why is it being introduced for the police in the 21st century? Listen very carefully to what the Honourable Lady says. What we're trying to do through the College of Policing is to even further professionalise this vital profession, but I'll make sure the Home Secretary uh, contacts her about this particular issue. She pray. Speaker, um, what's the point of anyone clinging on to a plan B when plan A is so obviously working? Yeah. Um, it's not just um, it's not just plan B we're not hearing about anymore. They've, they've seemed to have stopped talking about the cost of living. They've dropped one. They've stopped that one about uh, how the deficit wouldn't come down. Remember when they told us growth would never come? They told us that we were going to lose a million jobs rather than gain a million jobs. But the biggest transformation of all is the silence of the Shadow Chancellor. They've got, they've got this, big, this big debate. There's a big debate today on banking, but he wasn't allowed on the radio. He won't be speaking in the House of Commons. They've got a novel idea. You hide your Shadow Chancellor by leaving him on the front bench. <laughs> Previously shown considerable leadership in apologising to victims of state violence in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, those victims of paramilitary violence who made up the majority of victims of the Troubles have not had access to such apologies. Does the Prime Minister agree that the half proposals for dealing with the past offer the best opportunity for victims and survivors to receive truth and justice? And will he commit as Prime Minister to backing those proposals, helping by cooperating and also by funding those proposals? Mr. What I'd say to the Honourable Lady is I think there's a lot of merit in the Haas proposals. I think he did some excellent work. I noted that uh, Peter Robinson, the, the First Minister of Northern Ireland, described them as providing the architecture for future agreement and discussion. So I hope we can take the Haas work, including the very difficult work done on the past, and, and take that forward uh, with uh, all sides trying to agree. Simon Hart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm not sure if the uh, Prime Minister is a follower of Benefit Street on Channel 4, but if he is, uh, he will know that, sadly, there is a street like this in every constituency in the land. So does he agree with me that, as part of our long-term economic plans, we make sure that the benefit uh, system is there for people who need it? It isn't a lifestyle choice, and people don't get trapped in it. Yeah. I've only managed to catch a, a small amount of this uh, programme, but I think it brings home two vital points. One is that we need a welfare system that is tailored to make sure that work always pays. But there is a second point, which is that many people in our country have multiple disadvantages and problems where you need help to help to get people out of uh, that poverty and benefit dependency. So it's not just about tailoring a benefit system to make work pay, it's making sure we intervene in people's lives and try and correct the things that are keeping them out of work and out out of earning a decent living. Mr Jack Straw. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I say to the Prime Minister, as someone who strongly supports shale gas uh, extraction uh, by fracking, 
that, however well-intentioned, his current package will not assuage local communities who are, frankly, on a cross-party basis in Lancashire, treated his latest offers as, as near derisory. Why can he and the Chancellor not sit down with the cross-party local government association and negotiate with them on their proposal, as in other countries, for 10 per cent of revenues to be shared with local communities? I thought actually the proposal from uh, some members was that it should be 10% of profits. And my point is actually 1% of revenues, which obviously start running the moment that shale starts coming out of the ground, could well be a better offer. Look, I'm very happy to sit down with anybody and discuss this issue because I think shale is so important for the future of our country. But the point I would make, having been to see uh, yesterday, uh, sorry, on Monday, the oil uh, platforms that are already there on the Nottinghamshire Lincolnshire border, it is worth making the point that those went ahead without any of the sort of community benefits that we are promising with shale. £100,000 when a well is dug before any uh, gas has reached the surface. 1% of revenues, which could be £7 to £10 million for a typical uh, fracking well. And then 100% retention of business rates, which for a set of wells could be £1.7 million, maybe £2 million for a local authority. Honourable members should think about how much council tax a small district or Metropolitan Authority raises and consider how much £1.7 to £2 million of revenue into that council, what a difference that could make. So by all means, let's talk about the facts and the figures and what we can do. But we also need to persuade people that this can go ahead without the environmental damage, without the problems that people are worried about. I think those are the concerns more than anything. Grateful. Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The leader, the leader of the Opposition has said uh, what Hollande is doing in France, I want to do in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Recent uh, events across the Channel. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that this is completely at odds with our long term economic plan? I didn't. Um I didn't catch all of uh, President Hollande's uh, press conference yesterday because I was appearing in front of the Liaison Committee. But one thing I did notice is that the French proposals now are to cut spending in order to cut taxes in order to make the economy more competitive. Now, perhaps the uh, Shadow Chancellor in his new silent form will want to consider some of these ideas and recognise that this revolution of making business more competitive, of trying to win in the global race, that's a proper plan for the economy. Order.